Hello, my name is Mahali Shower, and I go to Humboldt State University in Arcata, California. And I've been working in the Price Lab with Ben, Brittany, and Nicole, investigating the potential capabilities for saccharina latissima to mitigate the effects of ocean acidification in a warming ocean. So surface temperatures have been rising faster in the Gulf of Maine than almost anywhere else globally. This is a figure showing the average sea surface temperature rises from 1982 to 2015. And you can see that the Gulf of Maine is this area in bright red. And down here you can see where the Gulf of Maine is relative to the rest of the world. And coastal ocean acidification is also already apparent in the Gulf of Maine. This is a graphic showing the aragonite saturation, um, the mean monthly minimums. And aragonite saturation is an interesting thing to look at because it shows the available calcium or the calcification potential for marine calcifying organisms. And the equation in calcifying the aragonite saturation um, factors in carbonate and calcium ions as well as um, it's sensitive to low pHs. And so here in, oh God, in the Gulf of Maine, you can see that we're already really low in that. And actually, when you get below 1.5, um, Joe Salisbury published a paper saying that um, at those levels, the, um, the marine calcifiers are at risk um, for decreased calcification rates. So here in the Gulf of Maine, we're actually already down in those low risky levels. So saccharina latissima provides a lot of really important ecosystem services. And in my study, I'm primarily looking at its role as a carbon fixer um, to potentially help mitigate the effects of ocean acidification. Um, sugar kelp is also locally farmed. And it's actually interesting, the Gulf of Maine is home to the first and second kelp farms in the nation. And um, so we're looking to see the potential scale at which these kelp farms can help to mitigate the effects of ocean acidification locally for shell fisheries. One of the issues that these kelp farmers face are epiphytes, which are marine biofowlers that grow on the surface of the kelp and degrade the tissue and also make it difficult for processing for human consumption. So one of the other things that we looked at in this study is how the potential um, response of the sugar kelp might change to these epiphytes, their chemical response, um, an allelopathic response, in a projected um, ocean acidification and ocean warming scenario. So last year, Nicole's RU looked at four different seaweeds that occur locally to see at these projected um, just ocean acidification scenarios, which would be the most effective at fixing this carbon, and found that saccharina latissima was the most effective. Their study, however, only looked at the ocean acidification and did not factor in the warming. So this year, we decided to look at the warming. So we tested the projected um, ocean acidification as well as the projected ocean sea surface temperature rises. So the question that we were asking is, how effective will saccharina latissima be at phytoremediation and anti-fouling in a more acidic and warmer ocean? And the hypotheses that we were testing are that when we increase the PCO2 and it increased the temperature, that first the, in, the CO2 would increase in uptake, the kelp would take it in faster, and that there would be a decrease in metabolism. We also hypothesized that that would lead to an increase in the photosynthetic rate, which would be measured in the amount of oxygen evolved as well as the photosynthetic yield, which is given back to us in these FV over FM units. And that would lead to an overall increase in the photosynthetic quotient, which is Q. And it's a ratio of how efficiently marine macrophytes um, take in CO2 and release oxygen. We also hypothesized that there would be an increase in this biofilm diversity, um, so that the bacteria that cause the like, mucousy layer on top of the kelp would have more bacteria in it in projected conditions, and that there would be an increase in this anti-fouling enzyme called haloperoxidase. Um, so in order to test this, we collected juvenile kelp right here off of the, do the dock at Bigelow and over at Ocean Point, and we place them into little one liter microcosms and subject them to um, these treatment conditions for a 48 hour acclimation period. The ambient 
treatments um, had a pH of about 8.09 and a temperature of about 15.55. Um, and we ended up having um, the air that was just bubbled in from outside was at a PCO2 level of 35, or excuse me, 356. And whereas the projected kelp had a pH of 7.82, and that was occurred by putting premixed CO2, bubbling that into the microcosms. And we also had a heater in those tables to raise the temperature up to about 20.4. And we ended up achieving a PCO2 level of about 580. And the dissolved oxygen and salinity remained relatively constant um, for the both treatments during the acclimation period. So in order to test the first hypothesis, um, first after the first 24 hours of acclimation, we took PAM readings. And PAM stands for Pulse Amplitude Modulated Fluorometry. And essentially, all this means is that we are subjecting the kelp to a really bright, saturating light that um, then the photosystems absorb, and the amount of light that the photosystems don't absorb and bounce back gives us the FV over FM reading, which is the photosynthetic yield. And we get this number from zero being really unhealthy to one being the healthiest. Um, then after 48 hours, we conducted these metabolic assays where we um, took dissolved oxygen, pH, and temperature readings as well as alk total alkalinity and nutrient samples before and after a two-hour period where the microcosms were sealed and there was a magnetic stir bar placed in the bottom to maintain water circulation. At the end of all this, we used the CO2 cis software to calculate the PCO2 and aragonite saturation. So back to the photosynthetic yield. Um, and this graph and the rest of the graphs I'm going to be showing you on the x-axis, the ambient are going to be shown in solid colors, and the projected are going to be shown in these hashed colors. And then on the y-axis here, we have the photosynthetic yield. Again, remembering that the really unhealthy kelp would be at a rating closer to zero, and the healthier kelp will be closer to one. So on each individual, we took two readings, one at the meristematic tissue, which is the newer growth down here, and one at the older tissue up towards the top. And we found that there was a significant difference in the health of the tissue based on where we took the reading of the kelp. So the meristematic tissue was actually healthier and had a higher photosynthetic yield than the older tissue. We also found that there was a significant, um, significantly higher health in the ambient kelp than the, in the projected. So when we crossed the treatment by location, we found that there was no effect. So this is just showing that the ambient kelp were healthier than the projected. So after 48 hours, we conducted those metabolic assays, which I referred to before. And here, um, we'll start over here with graph B, where we have on the y-axis the change in PCO2. And we can see that the ambient kelp actually decreased the PCO2 level, which is what we were looking for for something that would effectively mitigate ocean acidification. We want to see that reduce in CO2. Unfortunately, we saw an increase in the CO2 in the projected kelp, showing that they actually released more CO2 into the water. Over here in graph B, we looked at the mean change in oxygen, and we saw that the ambient kelp put more oxygen into the water than the projected kelp. And here in C, we have that measure of photosynthetic quotient again, which is relating the amount of CO2 that the kelp took in to the amount of O2 that they released. And we see that the ambient had a positive um, Q, so they were effectively and efficiently photosynthesizing, whereas the ambient, excuse me, whereas the projected actually decreased the amount of CO2, or excuse me, increased the amount of CO2 that was in their treatment. And lastly, we have that aragonite saturation that we talked about earlier. And we found in the ambient actually helped raise that aragonite saturation up to those ideal levels, whereas the projected kelp actually decreased the aragonite saturation, bringing it down even further. So all this means is that the projected kelp were photorespiring more than they were photosynthesizing, meaning that they were putting more CO2 into the water than they were taking out. And I like to think of this as the kelp being shellfish about helping the shellfish. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the second part of my project, we, look at the, we looked at the kelp coverage in East Booth Bay. And we did dives right off of the Bigelow Lab. And we did some dives down at Ocean Point 
to assess the overall health of the kelp in the areas. And we found that the kelp right off of Bigelow had a really narrow depth range and were found fairly shallow and were all covered in a layer of sediment. Whereas the kelp that we found at Ocean Point were a lot healthier and they were found in a wider depth range. Um, and they didn't have that same sediment layer over them and so we decided to use the kelp off of the Bigelow dock for our bacterial analysis because we thought there would be a more interesting biofilm um, community. So lastly, we looked at the anti-fouling enzyme, this haloperoxidase. And after the uh, metabolic assays, we flash froze the samples in liquid nitrogen and stored them at minus 80. And then we ground them up with a mortar and pestle and put them in a bead beading tube with garnet and um, used a novel approach utilizing fluorometry to try to detect the enzyme activity. And the fluorometer gave us these units back in photons per second per second, and then we related this back to the weight of the individual. And we found that there was no difference um, between the two treatments in haloperoxidase activity, and that actually has some interesting implications for the kelp that potentially in projected scenarios, they would not be less effective at um, fighting off these fouling organisms. So it turns out that all of my hypotheses were wrong. Um, when we increased the PCO2 and increased the temperature, we actually saw a decrease in CO2 uptake and an increase in metabolism. We also saw a decrease in the photosynthetic rate and a decrease in Q. And we actually just got this data back 20 minutes ago and saw that um, there's also no difference in the um, biofilm diversity, but we did have a small sample size um, when we processed that. And that there is no difference in this anti-fouling enzyme activity. So in conclusion, assuming that these kelp are not able to locally adapt or acclimate to these rising temperatures, then they would have a diminished capacity to phytoremediate and no change in fouling prevention. More studies need to be done to understand the local potential for adaptation to a warming ocean, and we actually found a study showing that kelp of the same species from New York and Maine, um, out of the two, the kelp from New York had a higher temperature threshold. Um, in temperature tolerance capability, indicating that they would have um, the ability potentially to acclimate to these projected conditions. And this implies, again, that the saccharine latissima would be less effective at phytoremediation in a warmer and more acidic ocean, but now is a great time to start implementing these phytoremediation um, capabilities of the kelp. And it, what's also interesting and important to note is that these kelps that are farmed are farmed from October to May, so they wouldn't be subject to these high temperatures during their growing season. But a lot of these kelp farmers also collect their fertile tissue um, out during the summer months. So it would be interesting to see if the warmer waters have any effects on the vitality of the tissues um, that are collected because of the rising temperatures. And also, I would like to just add that if you're interested in incorporating um, kelp into your lifestyle in art or in food to help create a higher demand for this species, um, we, the Price Lab has a lot of really cool books. And if you're interested in looking through them, um, we'll probably have them out at the barbecue and then they'll be in Nicole's office if you're curious about them um, at another time. And I would like to thank um, Bigelow, NSF, and all of the people who helped make this project possible. And um, at this time, I'll take any questions.
that's a lot. All right. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Um, how's the sound? Good? Yeah. All right. Hello, my name is Emma Posega Rapley. I'm a student at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. And this summer, I've been working with Nick Record to create an operational forecast of jellyfish in the Gulf of Maine using citizen reports and machine learning. In general, short-term ecosystem forecasting and species distribution models can be incredibly important tools to help us better understand ecosystems, to help us minimize harmful species-human interactions, and to help guide policy changes. But there are still very few examples of this forecasting on the short-term timescale that we've been looking at over the summer. Why jellyfish? It's been hypothesized that in recent decades, jellyfish populations are increasing in ecosystems around the world. But because survey, scientific survey data historically lacks information on jellyfish, it's been hard to thoroughly investigate these hypotheses. Additionally, concerns have been raised locally over the number of jellyfish showing up in the Gulf of Maine. In addition to being a nuisance to swimmers, these jellyfish can actually clog equipment and machinery and interfere with fishing, recreation, and tourism. That right there is the USS Ronald Reagan, which was temporarily disabled in 2006 after it went through a large bloom of jellyfish. So they can cause problems much bigger than themselves. <laughs> so in the place of scientific survey data, we've been able to use some of this interest in jellyfish in the Gulf of Maine to gather citizen reports of jellyfish sightings. And from these, we've collected information on the location and dates of the sightings, along with optional information on the species, the number present, and any descriptions and pictures of the sighting. And here's where I will interrupt myself to shamelessly advertise. If you want to be immortalized in our jellyfish sighting spreadsheet, and you've seen a jellyfish around the Gulf, uh, consider sending an email to jellyfish at bigelow.org. Now, to actually analyze all of these emails we're getting, we're using Maxent, which is machine learning species distribution modeling method that works well on presence-only data, which is good because, again, for an organism like jellyfish, presence-only data is we really all we have to work with right now. And it's based on the maximum entropy principle, which is model what you know and assume as little as possible. It considers environmental factors like temperature as covariates, then uses randomly selected background points along with sightings points to estimate the effect of these covariates on species distribution. The function we're using also generates a model area under the curve, or AUC, of the receiver operating characteristic curve, or ROC. It's a lot of acronyms. Um, and I want to go into a little more detail on the AUC since it's going to be important in my results. This is an example of a receiver operating characteristic curve. The red line right there indicates a bad AUC of 0.5, which is the equivalent of us randomly guessing where jellyfish might show up. The higher the AUC is, the better. The green line indicates a perfect AUC of one. And here's two examples of AUCs in the wild and what they actually sort of look like. Um, the top, both were made for the same day, um, but the top was forecast using a model fit to five days of data, and the bottom was forecast using a model fit to 80 days of data. You'll notice that the top forecast has a higher model and forecast AUC, and the sightings circled in the dotted white line are in an area of higher probability than the lower forecast. So, we're using these tools to answer the three questions. What are the effects of these environmental predictors on jellyfish distribution? And do these differ by species? Are these effects stationary or non-stationary? And how can we use this information to create the best possible system to model and forecast jellyfish distribution in the Gulf of Maine? So we'll be looking at the Gulf of Maine region and taking daily measurements of photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR, and sea surface temperature, or SST. We also used bathymetry for some of our models. And each of our models was generated by inputting 1,000 randomly selected background points along with a window of sightings data and these measurements into our Maxent function. The Maxent function returned models that allowed us to estimate the effect of these predictors on jellyfish and allowed us to generate forecasts. And here's another sort of look under the hood at some of the information that this Maxent function gives us. These two curves are the probability of presence of jellyfish at different PAR and SST levels. 
So first we looked at the effects of different predictors on jellyfish. We took all of the 2015 sightings data and broke it down into four groups. We kept one with all sightings. One just had moon jellyfish sightings, one had lion's mane sightings, and one had white cross sightings. And for each of these sightings group, we created 40 models fit to all jellyfish within the sightings group in the 2015 sightings. And half of these models used PAR and SST as predictors, and half used PAR, SST, and bathymetry. And here are our results. The bars are the percent contribution, the mean percent contribution of PAR, SST, and over here, bathymetry. We found significant differences between predictors in all of the sightings groups, except in the two instances circled here and here. And we've also found that bathymetry had dominant contribution in all models that did use bathymetry. When we did not use bathymetry, SST always had the dominant contribution. We also had all of our mean AUCs above 0.85, which is a really good score. So next we looked at the stationarity of these percent contributions. We broke May 29th, 2015 to September 27th, 2015 into 102 overlapping 20-day intervals and fit 20 models to the sightings within each of these 20-day intervals. And here are the mean percent contributions of those 20 models for those 102 windows plotted out right there. And above are the model, is a box plot of the model AUCs, and above that is the number of available sightings. So you'll notice that in early June, SST contributions rose to 100% and AUC values dropped to 0.6. We still don't know why that happened, but it does merit a closer look. You'll also notice that there were significant changes in SST and PAR percent contribution over time. Finally, we looked at what would be the best window of sightings time to fit our forecasting model to. So to find the sort of the level of accuracy of different sized windows, we took each of the 18 days in August 2015 with available sightings and created 80 models for them fit to one previous day of data to 80 previous days of data. And these are the results for that. This is a box plot of the model AUC and the forecast AUC. Uh, for each of the 18 days, for models fit from one day of data to 80 days of data. And we found that both model and forecast AUC values did show a slight but significant decrease over time, but we also found that the variance in AUCs decreased, excuse me, not over time, over the size of the model window. But we also found that the variance decreased as the model window size increased. So. From the predictor effect experiment, we found that jellyfish are in fact associated with particular SST, PAR, and bathymetry levels, but their response extent differs with species. We also found that model AUC values were high over different sightings group, which gave us hope that we could eventually create a reliable forecast for jellyfish distribution. From the non-stationarity experiment, we found that predictor effects are indeed non-stationary, which let us know that we needed to create an adaptive algorithm that would move with the days to most accurately forecast jellyfish distribution. And from the forecast experiment, we found that models with the shortest time windows provided better forecast fits, but at the cost of a greater risk of a rogue bad forecast fit. So from this information, we decided on creating a model with an initial sliding window of 30 days of data to balance uh, having a good forecast fit with avoiding some of those variations in AUC we saw with the smallest model windows. Uh, and the adaptive elements of the model will include regular reevaluation using public feedback and adjustment based on forecast fit and the number of sightings available within the window. And this right here, I wish the color were better up here, but this is actually a forecast for July 31st using all data from 2015 and it actually sort of matches up with the sightings we've been getting, which is pretty cool. And finally, I'd like to thank the Bigelow REU program, uh, Nick Record and Ben Tupper, the IT department for making this possible, and everyone who sent in jellyfish reports because this project would really not have been possible without those. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Question. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. How many emails did you get to do this? 
Well, I haven't added up 2016 yet. From 2015, we had around 300, okay. at least in the spreadsheet. I didn't think of that, but that would be really interesting to sort of look into. Yeah. Yes. So related to the question, how many emails have you got? Mm -hmm. I wonder how secure they are. Are you getting a lot of emails one time of the year and not of the other times of the year? And is that because jellyfish are more dominant sometimes, or simply because people are not caught with wolves and sometimes? I think it's a mixture. Um, uh, well, if I want to be really technical about it, this is less of a map of jellyfish distribution and more of a map of the likelihood of humans running into jellyfish. So, um, yeah, if we're being technical, that's what it really is. Uh, but yeah, there's going to be a lot fewer sightings in January uh, than there will be in August, for instance, uh, which is why we looked at adjusting our model time window based on the time of year because, again, in January, we're probably not going to have any sightings. So we'll need to stretch that out to maybe the six previous months of sightings. And we could tell from the different uh, forecast AUCs that there were still actually really good AUC scores at that level. They were just slightly lower. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know about that. I'd have to look through the spreadsheet. But yeah, I don't know about specific people reporting. Yes. Did, you did a time window. Did you also do a space window? So how much space do you incorporate? And what is that space window? Uh, no, I have not done a space window. But that would be really interesting to include. So like starting with a smaller window focused on just one part of the Gulf and then yeah. moving outward. Yeah, that would be really interesting to look at, see if it was more accurate in some places than others. So in the model results that you got, mm -hmm. it's either you can predict whether it's going to happen somewhere in the entire Gulf or not mm -hmm. at this point. Yep, got it. Yes. I'm curious about this question of observations as well, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but maybe a little more biologically, like just on a diurnal basis, do they, do they come up at night? Maybe um, Well, I can't talk much about the, um, their behavior during the night and day. We do get some sightings from the night. Uh, I know that. I've, like, we'll get people out boating at night or fishing at night who will send in their reports. But yeah, I don't know what the exact numbers are on which jellyfish uh, are most active when. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it could be safe for the barbecue. Sorry. <laughs> Can everyone hear me fine? So I'm Briar Bragdon, and my mentors were Sherry Flogey and David Fields, and I'm currently a student at the University of New England. And my project is the effect of myovirus infection on Synecococcus photosynthesis. So first, why Synecococcus? So Synecococcus is one of the most abundant phototrophs in the entire world, and you can see from this diagram here, that at any given time at the surface, there can be up to 50,000 cells per mil, so they're a very abundant organism. They're also responsible for about 17% of the total glo global primary production, so they're very important. Um, living alongside these synecococcus are viruses, specifically cyanomyoviruses, were what I was looking at, and there's estimated to be about one times 10 to the fifth synecococcus viruses living alongside them, and at any given time, between 1 and 30 percent of synecococcus is infected and eventually lies from these viruses daily. And what's interesting about these cyanomyoviruses is that they have these things called viral photosynthesis genes. And these viral photosynthesis genes are used um, at the point 
when the viruses are inside of the cell and replicating, which I'll explain in this slide right here. So within the virus cycle, the virus first adsorbs to a cell right there, then it dumps its genetic material, and at this point it's hijacking the cell, and when this is going on is when the viral photosynthesis genes for these cyanomyoviruses are activated, and then they use those genes to then uh, harvest energy to replicate themselves during this period, and eventually they lyse and release their uh, replicated cells. And this period is called the latent period, which is the moment of time that I will be specifically looking at when I'm infecting my cultures. So what's also interesting about these cyanomyoviruses is that they have a very broad range of hosts. So over here on the left is a phylogenetic tree of Synecococcus and Prochlorococcus. And uh, Prochlorococcus is another cyanobacteria that is uh, closely related to Synecococcus. And across the top are cyanomyoviruses that have been isolated from one specific person. And all of the, all of the um, solid dots are original host virus pairs. So these are ones that have, were originally isolated in the wild from. And the open dots are alternate host virus pairs. And so what I will be doing is looking at how these different interactions between these affect the photosynthetic efficiency of the Synecococcus during this latent period of the viruses. So these are the two uh, possibilities that I may, may or may not see. On the left are past studies. Previously, there have only been about three host virus pairs ever tested to see their effect on the photosynthetic efficiency. And with this one, they show that the photosynthetic efficiency had no effect during the infective um, cells. And then this graph right here is from an unpublished study uh, from my mentor that she found one host virus pair that did show a decrease in photosynthetic efficiency. So what I wanted to look at was look at more of these host virus pairs to see if there is more differences. So this led me to the question, do other unstudied viruses have a negative impact on the photosynthetic efficiency? And my hypothesis was that there would be more um, viruses that have a negative impact. So for my methods, I had four host virus pairs, which are listed there. Uh, the numbers and letters have to do with where they came from. Um, and in this table here were the ones I had access to. And once again, the A is the alternate host and O is the original host. And the highlighted ones are the ones that I ended up using. So during the infection, I infected with a multiplicity of infection of three. So this means for every cell of Synecococcus, there is three infective particles within the flask. And I took a sample every two to three hours for 10 hours and one sample at 24 hours. Uh, the reason why I did it so vigorously for 10 hours is because this is about the latent, the time of the latent period for these viruses. Uh, among these samples that I took, I took samples that were run um, on the flow cytometer to determine cell and virus counts. And over on the left is uh, what it looks like for the virus. Right here is SSHM2, and here is the fluorescence and the side scatter across the bottom. And this determines the size of the particles. And these are, the viruses are nucleic acid stained since the uh, viruses are unable to produce their own fluorescence. They have to be stained. And then over here, is the Synecococcus, specifically WH7803. And I had two separate samples for each because they had to do two different dilution factors and then to make sure I'm only counting Synecococcus. And in order to test the photosynthetic efficiency, I used fast repetition rate fluorometry. Um, and that measured the FV over FM, which is calculated using a fluorescence curve. So it takes the maximum fluorescence subtracts it from the initial fluorescence and then divides it again by the maximum fluorescence. And it gets these fluorescent measurements by uh, saturating the cells with a, a bunch of light. And then it picks up, the machine picks up the fluorescence out. And from this, we're able to determine how much light the cell is actually using for photosystem two. And I also did fluorescent light curves. So this was used by taking the samples and dark adapting them for 30 minutes before processing them. And the fluorescent light curves were used to determine how um, sensitive they were to different light intensities. So for my data, what I determined 
was that for these two host virus pairs, they are both alternate virus host virus pairs, 7803 SSM5 and 7803 SSHM2. For both of them, eventually there was a significant increase in the photosynthetic efficiency while they were infected. So the green line is the infected and the purple line is the control. And same thing again, it's the photosynthetic efficiency and the hours uh, post-infection. Green is infected, purple is control. Uh, this top one, 7803 and SIN1 is an alternate host pair and it's 8101 and SIN1 are an original host virus pair. And this one, the 7803 and SIN1, showed no significant difference in the photosynthetic efficiency, but 8101 and SIN1 eventually did show a significant difference in the photosynthetic efficiency. And it was, a, it was increased. And then with the fluorescent light curves, for these two alternate host virus pairs, with 7803 and SSM5 and 7803 SSHM2, the ones that were infected uh, were able to handle a higher light intensity than the control. And then once again, these are, this is uh, fluorescent light curves, and then 7803 with SIN1 and 8101 with SIN1, no, uh, there was no significant difference in uh, the amount of high of the light intensity they were able to handle. So what does all this mean? So one important thing is that the fact that I was able this summer to completely double the amount of data available on how these viruses were able, or affects the photosynthetic efficiency of Sinecococcus, because previously there was only three, and now I added four more. Um, so, and also my data suggests that these cyanomyoviruses are able to maintain or sometimes even increase the photosynthetic efficiency. And the data also suggests that these infected cells may also be able to handle higher light intensities. And all this is really important because being able to tell how these different host virus pairs interact that have never been studied before, and it also makes modeling of primary production significantly easier if these viruses aren't having any effect, even though they have a 10-hour possible latent period during the day. And I would like to thank everyone that helped and everyone here. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please ask. Yes. So um, this might be a little bit off topic. Uh, how many cycles of viral replication and cell survive do they die? Uh, no, they, I'm not sure exactly how much they replicate, but they replicate within the cell for about 10 hours, and then they lies, so and then. Uh, for which one? Um, I'm not entirely sure what it could be is the own cycle of the Sinecococcus itself because the controls are also showing a up and down as well. And I found that throughout the entire experiment with the multiple times I ran it, that there, it wasn't consistent the entire time. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, my name's Amanda Herzog. I go to Wheaton College in Massachusetts, and I've been working in Dr. Christoph Apley's lab this summer on my project called Linking Chemical Composition to Toxicity of Fresh and Weathered Oil Samples Collected from the 2010 Gulf of Mexico Oil Spill. So the Gulf Spill began on April 20th, 2010. It leaked for 84 days and released nearly 5 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. It affected over 1,000 kilometers of shoreline, and all these factors make it the largest marine oil spill in US history. 
So this spill was particularly unique because it happened at about 5,000 feet below the surface. So once the oil was released, it had quite a long way to travel up through the water column until it reached the surface because oil is less dense than water. So these, uh, as it travels up through the water column, it goes through various different weathering processes, um, physical and chemical, so things like evaporation, dissolution, photooxidation, biodegradation, and all of these factors chemically change the composition of the oil. So we know that throughout weathering, the oil composition changes quite a bit. So previous research has shown that crude oil, fresh, the fresh oil, is made up of many compounds, some of those being toxic polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are PAHs. Um, these are two examples, naphthalene and phenantrene, um, as well as BTEX compounds, which are things like benzene and toluene, just an example. And these are very small, light aromatic rings. So we know that our BTEX compounds are lost very quickly, and then our PHs are lost um, pretty quickly, but not as quickly as the BTEX compounds. And research has also shown that throughout weathering, we have new compounds forming, which are um, new polar compounds. So an example would be a carboxylic acid. So we know that a lot of the compounds in crude oil are toxic, but there's been very um, little research done on the toxicity of weathered oil. So my overarching question is we know the composition changes, but does oil toxicity change over the years? So for my project, we have four different samples. The first being fresh crude oil, which is representative of what was released from the well at the time of the spill. The second is slick oil, which is the oil sheen on the water surface, and that's from about five to 30 days after the spill. And then we have oil-soaked sands, which are in this picture, which we refer to as sand patties. And we have those samples from 2014. And my lab actually took a trip to Florida and Alabama to get most recent samples. We went this past June. And on this map, we collected samples in Gulf Shores, Alabama, and Fort Morgan, which is farther out on this peninsula. So we walked along the beaches. The first day, we walked almost 10 miles on the beach, collecting these sand patties. Um, they're made up of about 90% sand and 10% oil. And it's pretty cool when you smell them. They actually smell faintly of oil, and they're sticky. And we found them just walking along the beach and along the surf in this picture. So we got lots of strange looks while we were walking around in bright purple gloves. <laughs> and so this map over here shows where the Deepwater Horizon exploded um, on April 20th. And it shows the evolution of the oil slick. So this green mass is the oil slick five days after the initial spill. And then a month later, the spill gets a lot bigger, and, it, and the oil sheen gets a lot bigger, and it's starting to affect the beaches of Louisiana. A month later, at the end of June, it's starting to affect the beaches where we visited. Another month later, this is after the well was capped, so it stopped leaking. You can see the oil slick has diminished quite a bit. And another month, at the end of August, it's almost gone. So to chemically analyze our samples, we first extracted the oil from our samples. We then made a water accommodated fraction, a WAF, which is seen in this picture. So what we do is we take our extracted oil and put it on top of seawater. And then we mix that for about 18 hours to allow the water soluble compounds in the oil to go into the seawater layer. And we do this because most of the compounds that are responsible for, to for toxicity are water soluble. So after 18 hours, we drain out this bottom layer um, seawater and water soluble compounds, and we extract the oil from our WAF. And then we use gas chromatography, mass spectrometry to quantify the different compounds in our oil mixture. For toxicity, we have two different methods because um, toxicity is a relatively loosely defined term. So our first method uses microtox, which is this machine over here. And it's an EPA recommended bioassay that uses a bioluminescent bacteria. Vibrio Fischeri to measure toxicity. So the inhibition of bioluminescence is directly related to how toxic something is. And this is known to be a good model for toxicity. And um, this particular bacteria is found globally, so it's relevant to the Gulf of Mexico. Our second assay used copepods, which is this organism over here. It's about the thickness of your fingernail. Um,